Chapter 13. Fast food restaurant. My life goal is realised. Any fries with that? When I was a god, I would have been pleased to have a beautiful woman pull me behind a building, but as Lester, with Calypso, I was more likely to get killed than kissed. We crouched next to a stack of milk crates by the kitchen entrance. The area smelled of cooking grease, pigeon droppings and chlorine from the nearby children's splash park. Calypso rattled the locked door, then glared at me. Help, she hissed. What am I supposed to do? Well, now would be a good time to have a burst of godly strength. I should never have told her and Leah about that. Once when facing Nero at Camp Half-Blood, my superhuman power had briefly returned, allowing me to overcome the Emperor's Germani. I'd thrown one of them into the sky, where, for all I knew, he was still in low Earth orbit. But what moment? But that moment had quickly passed. My strength hadn't returned since. Regardless, Leo and Calypso seemed to think I could summon godly bursts of awesomeness any time I wanted, just because I was a former god. I found that unfair. I gave the door a try. I yanked the handle and almost pulled my fingers out of their sockets. Ow, I muttered. Mortals have got good at making doors. Now, back in the Bronze Age, Calypso shushed me. Our enemies' voices were getting closer. I couldn't hear Latirisus, but two other men were conversing in a guttural language that sounded like ancient Gallic. I doubted they were zookeepers. Calypso frat frantically pulled a bobby pin from her hair. Aha! So her lovely coiffed locks did not stay in place by magic. She pointed at me, then pointed around the corner. I thought she was telling me to flee and save myself. That would have been a sensible suggestion. Then I realised she was asking me to keep watch. I didn't know what good that would do, but I peered over the rampart of milk crates and waited for Germani to come and kill us. I could hear them at the front of the cafe, rattling the shutter over the order window, then conversing briefly with lots of grunts and grumbling. Knowing the Emperor's bodyguards, they were probably saying something like, Kill? Kill? Bash heads? Bash heads? I wondered why Latirisus had split his people into two groups. Surely they already knew where the griffins were being kept. Why then were they searching the park? Unless, of course, they were searching for intruders, specifically us. Calypso snapped her hairpin in two. She inserted the metal pieces in the door lock and began to wriggle them. Her eyes closed as if she were in deep concentration. Ridiculous, I thought. That only works in movies and Homeric epics. Click. The door swung open. And inward, Calypso waved me inside. She yanked the pin shards out of the lock, then followed me across the threshold, gently closing the door behind us. She turned the dead bolt just before someone outside shook the handle. A gruff voice muttered in Gallic, probably something like, No luck. Bash heads elsewhere. Footsteps receded. I finally remembered to breathe. I faced Calypso. How did you pick the lock? She stared at the broken hairpin in her hand. I... I thought about weaving. Weaving? I can still weave. I spent thousands of years practicing at the loom. I thought maybe, I don't know, man manipulating pins in a lock wouldn't be too different than weaving thread in a loom. The two things sounded very different to me, but I couldn't argue with the results. So it wasn't magic then. I tried to contain my disappointment. Having a few wind spirits at our command would have been very helpful. No, she said. You'll know when I get my magic back because you'll find yourself being tossed across Indianapolis. That's something to look forward to. I scanned the dark interior of the snack bar. Against the back wall were the basics, a sink, a deep fryer, a stove top, two microwaves. Under the counter sat two horizontal freezers. How did I know the basics of a fast food kitchen, you ask? I had discovered the singer Pink while she was working at McDonald's. I found Queen Latifah at Burger King. I've spent a fair amount of time in such places. You can't discount any site where you might find talent. I checked the first freezer. Inside, reefed in cold mist, were carefully labelled boxes of ready-to-cook meals. But nothing that read tater tots. The second freezer was locked. Calypso, I said. Could you weave this open? Who's useless now, eh? In the interest of getting my way, I decided not to answer. I stepped back as Calypso worked her non-magical skills. She popped this lock even faster than the first. Well done. I lifted the freezer lid. Ah! Hundreds of packages were wrapped in white butcher paper, each labelled in black marker. Calypso squinted at the descriptions. Carnivorous horse mix, combat ostrich cubes, and griffin taters. She turned to me with a horrified look. Surely they're not grinding animals into food. I remembered a long-ago banquet with the spiteful King Tantalus, who had served the gods a stew made from his own sons. With humans, anything was possible, but in this case, I didn't think the cafe was putting mythical wildlife on the menu. These items are under lock and key, I said. I'm guessing they've been set aside as treats for the zoo's rarest animals. That's a mix of food for a carnivorous horse. 
not a mixture of carnivorous horse. Calypso looked only slightly less nauseated. What in the world is a combat ostrich? The question triggered an old memory. I was overwhelmed by a vision as powerful as the stench of an unwashed lemur cage. I found myself lounging on a couch in the campaign tent of my friend Commodus. He was in the midst of a military campaign with his father, Marcus Aurelius, but nothing about the tent suggested the harsh life of the Roman legion. Overhead, a white silk canopy billowed in the gentle breeze. In one corner, a musician sat discreetly serenading us with his lyre. Under our feet spread the finest rugs from the eastern provinces, each one as expensive as an entire villa in Rome. Between our two couches, a table was spread with an afternoon snack of roast boar, pheasant, salmon and fruit spilling from a solid gold cornucopia. I was amusing myself by throwing grapes at Commodus's mouth. Of course, I never missed unless I wanted to, but it was fun to watch the fruit bounce off Commodus's nose. You are terrible, he teased me. And you are perfect, I thought, but I merely smiled. He was eighteen. In mortal form, I appeared to be a youth of the same age, but even with my godly enhancements, I could hardly have been more handsome than the princeps. Despite his easy life, being born into the purple of the imperial household, Commodus was the very model of athletic perfection. His body live and muscular, his golden hair in ringlets around his Olympian face. His physical strength was already renowned, drawing comparisons to the legendary hero Hercules. I threw another grape. He caught it in his hand and studied the little orb. Oh, Apollo. He knew my real identity, yes. We had been friends, more than friends, for almost a month at that point. I get so weary of these campaigns. My father has been at war virtually his entire reign. Such a hard life for you. I gestured at the opulence around us. Yes, but it's ridiculous. Tromping around Danu Danubian forests, stamping out barbarian tribes that are really no threat to Rome. What's the point of being emperor if you're never in the capital having fun? I nibbled on a piece of boar meat. Why not talk to your father? Ask for a furlough. Commodus snorted. You know what he'll do. Give me another lecture on duty and morality. He is so virtuous, so perfect, so esteemed. He put those words in air circles, since air quotes had not been invented. I could certainly sympathise with his feelings. Marcus Aurelius was the sternest, most powerful father in the world, aside from my own father Zeus. Both loved to lecture. Both loved to remind their offspring how lucky they were, how privileged, how far short they fell of their father's expectations. And of course, both had gorgeous, talented, tragically underappreciated sons. Commodus squished his grape and watched the juice trickle down his fingers. My father made me his junior co-emperor when I was 15, Apollo. It's stifling, all duty, all the time. Then he married me off to that horrid girl, Brutia Crispina. Who names their child Brutia? I didn't mean to laugh at the expense of his distant wife, but part of me was pleased when he talked badly about her. I wanted all his attention for myself. Well, someday you'll be the sole emperor, I said. Then you can make the rules. I'll make peace with the barbarians, he said immediately. Then we'll go home and celebrate with games, the best games all the time. I'll gather the most exotic animals in the world. I'll fight them personally in the Colosseum. Tigers, elephants, ostriches. I laughed at that. Ostriches? Have you ever seen an ostrich? Oh, yes. He got a wistful look in his eyes. Amazing creatures. If you train them to fight, perhaps design some sort of armour for them, they would be incredible. You're a handsome idiot. I threw another grape, which bounced off his forehead. A brief flash of anger washed over his face. I knew my sweet Commodus could have an ugly temper. He was a little too fond of slaughter. But what did I care? I was a god. I could speak to him in ways no one else dared. The tent flap opened. A centurion stepped inside and saluted crisply, but his face was stricken, gleaming with sweat. Princeps. His voice quavered. It's your father. He... he is... He never spoke the word dead, but it seemed to float into the tent all around us, sapping the heat from the air. The lyre player stopped on a major seventh chord. Commodus looked at me, panic in his eyes. Go, I said, as calmly as I could, forcing down my misgivings. You will always have my blessings. You will be fine. But I already suspected what would happen. The young man I knew and loved was about to be consumed by the emperor he would become. He rose and kissed me one last time. His breath smelled of grapes. Then he left the tent, walking, as the Romans would say, into the mouth of the wolf. Apollo, Calypso nudged my arm. Don't go, I pleaded. Then my past life burned away. The sorceress was frowning at me. What do you mean, don't go? Did you have another vision? I scanned the dark kitchen of the snack bar. I... I'm fine. What's going on? Calypso pointed to the freezer. Look at the prices. I swallowed down the bitter taste of grapes and boar meat. In the freezer, on the corner of each white butcher paper package, a price was written in pencil. 
by far the most expensive, Griffin taters, $15,000 per serving. I'm not good at modern currency, I admitted, but isn't that a bit pricey for a meal? I was going to ask you the same thing, Calypso said. I know the S symbol with the line through it means American dollars, but the amount? She shrugged. I found it unfair that I was adventuring with someone as clueless as I was. A modern demigod could have easily told us, and they also would have had useful 21st century skills. Leo Valdez could repair machines, Percy Jackson could drive a car. I would even have settled for Meg McCaffrey and her garbage bag throwing prowess, though I knew that Meg, what Meg would say about our present predicament. You guys are dumb. I pulled out a packet of Griffin taters and unwrapped one corner. Inside, small frozen cubes of shredded potato gleamed with a golden metallic coating. Are tater tots usually sprayed with precious metal? I asked. Calypso picked one up. I don't think so, but the Griffin's like gold. My father told me that ages ago. I shuddered. I recalled her father, General Atlas, unleashing a flock of Griffins on me during the Titans' first war with the gods. Having your chariot swarmed by eagle-headed lions is not something you easily forget. So we take these taters to feed the Griffins, I guessed. With luck, this will help us win their trust. I pulled the arrow of Dodona from my quiver. Is that what you had in mind, most frustrating of arrows? The arrow vibrated. Verily, thou art denser than a combat ostrich cube. What did he say? Calypso asked. He said yes. From the counter, Calypso grabbed a paper menu with a map of the zoo on it. She pointed to an orange loop circling the plains area. Here. The loop was lab labelled Train Ride, the least creative name I could imagine. At the bottom, in a map key, was a more detailed explanation. Train Ride. A look at the zoo behind the zoo. Well, I said, at least they advertise the fact that they have a secret zoo behind the zoo. That was nice of them. I think it's time to ride the choo-choo, Calypso agreed. From the front of the cafe came a crashing sound, like a Germanus had tripped over a trash can. Stop that, barked Latiris. You stay here and keep watch. If they show, capture them. Don't kill them. You come with me. We need those griffins. I counted silently to five and then whispered to Calypso. Are they gone? Let me use my supervision to look through the wall and check, she said. Oh, wait. You are a terrible person. She pointed to the map. If Latiris has left one guard at the crossroads, it will be difficult to get out of here and reach the main train without him seeing us. Well, I said, I suppose we could go back to the way station and tell Britomartis that we tried. Calypso threw a frozen golden tater tot at me. When you were a god, if some heroes had returned empty-handed from a quest and told you, Oh, sorry, Apollo, we tried, would you be understanding? Certainly not. I would incinerate them. I would... Oh, oh, I see your point. I wrung my hands. Then what do we do? I don't feel like being incinerated. It hurts. Perhaps there's a way. Calypso traced her finger across the map to a section labelled meerkat, reptile and snake, which sounded like the worst law firm ever. I have an idea, she said. Bring your tots and follow me. Chapter 14. Yeah, we got the skills. Fake hexes and shooting feet. Teach you about pancakes. I did not wish to follow Calypso with or without my tots. Sadly, my only other option was to hide in the cafe until the Emperor's men found me or the cafe manager arrived and impressed me into service as a short-order cook. Calypso led the way, darting from hiding place to hiding place like the urban ninja she was. I spotted the lone Germanus on sentry duty, about 50 feet across the plaza, but he was busy studying the carousel. He pointed his pole arm warily at the painted horses as if they might be carnivorous. We made it to the far side of the crossroads without attracting his attention, but I was still nervous. For all we knew, Latiris might have multiple groups sweeping the park. On a telephone pole near the souvenir shop, a security camera stared down at us. If the triumvirate was as powerful as, powerful as Nero claimed, they could easily control surveillance inside the Indianapolis Zoo. Perhaps that was why Latiris was searching for us. He already knew we were here. I thought about shooting the camera with an arrow, but it was probably too late. Cameras loved me. No doubt my face was all over the security office monitors. Calypso's plan was to circumvent the orangutans and cut through the reptile display, skirting the park perimeter until we reached the train depot. Instead, as we passed the entrance to the ape habitat, voices of an approaching Germanus patrol startled us. We dived into the orangutan centre for cover. All right, I got startled and dived for cover. Calypso hissed, no, you idiot, and then followed me inside. Together we crouched behind a retaining wall as two Germanis strolled past, chatting casually about head-bashing techniques. I glanced to my right and stifled a yelp. On the other side of a glass wall, a large orangutan was staring at me, his amber eyes curious. He made some hand gestures, sign language. Ag Agamephus might have known, 
Judging from the great ape's expression, he was not terribly delighted to see me. Alas, among the great apes, only humans are capable of proper awe for the gods. On the plus side for orangutans, they have amazing orange fur that no human could possibly rival. Calypso nudged my leg. We need to keep moving. We scurried deeper into the display room. Our simian movements must have amused the orangutan. He made a deep barking noise. Shut up, I stage whispered back at him. At the far exit, we huddled behind a curtain of camouflage netting. I cradled my taters and tried to steady my breathing. Next to me, Calypso hummed under her breath, a nervous habit of hers. I wish she would stop. Whenever she hummed a tune I knew, I had the urge to sing harmony very loudly, which would have given away our position. At last, I whispered, I think the coast is clear. I stepped out and smacked straight into another Germanus. Honestly, how many barbarians did Commodus have? Was he burying them in bulk? For a moment, all three of us were too surprised to speak or move. Then the barbarian made a rumbling sound in his chest as if about to shout for backup. Hold these. I thrust my package of griffin food into his arms. Refle reflexively, he took them. After all, a man giving up his tots in a gesture of surrender in many cultures, he frowned at the package as I stepped back, slung my bow off my shoulder, fired and planted an arrow in his left foot. He howled, dropping the tater tots package. I scooped it up and ran, Calypso close behind me. Nicely done, she offered, except for the fact that he probably alerted the ear left. Another Germanus came barreling out of the reptile area. We scrambled around him and ran towards a sign that said Skyline. In the distance loomed an aerial tram, wires strung from tower to tower above the treetops, a single green gondola hanging about 50 feet in the air. I wondered if we could use the ride to reach the secret zoo area, or at least gain a height advantage, but the gondola house entrance was fenced off and padlocked. Before I could ask Calypso to work her hairpin hocus pocus, the German I concerned cornered us. The one from the reptile area advanced, his pole arm levelled at our chests. The one from the orangutan house came snarling and limping behind, my arrow still sticking out of his bloody leather boot. I knocked another arrow, but there was no way I could bring them both down before they killed us. I'd seen German I take six or seven arrows to the heart and still keep fighting. Calypso muttered, Apollo, when I curse you, pretend to faint. What? She wheeled on me and shouted, You have failed me for the last time, slave. She made a series of hand gestures I recognised from ancient times, hexes and curses, that no one had ever dared to make in my direction. I was tempted to slap her. Instead, I did as she asked. I gasped and collapsed. Through my half-lidded eyes, I watched Calypso turn on our enemies. Now it is your turn, fools. She began making the same rude gestures towards the Germani. The first one stopped. His face paled. He glanced at me lying on the ground and then turned and fled, barreling past his friend. The Germanus with the wounded foot hesitated. Judging from the hatred in his eyes, he wanted revenge for the missile weapon that had ruined his left boot. Calypso, undaunted, waved her arms and began to encant. Her tone made it sound as if she was raising the worst daemons from Tartarus. Though her words in ancient Phoenician were actually a recipe for making pancakes. The wounded Germanus yelped and hobbled away, leaving a trail of smeared red prints behind him. Calypso offered me a hand and pulled me up. Let's move. I've only bought us a few seconds. How did you? Did your magic return? I wish, she said. I faked it. Half of magic is acting like it will work. The other half is picking a superstitious mark. They'll be back with reinforcements. I'll admit I was impressed. Her hexing had certainly unnerved me. I made a quick gesture to ward off evil, just in case Calypso was better than she realised. Then we ran together along the perimeter fence. At the next crossroads, Calypso said, This way to the train. You're sure? She nodded. I'm good at memorising maps. Once I made one of Aegea, reproduced every square foot of that island. It was the only way I kept myself sane. This sounded like a terrible way to keep oneself sane, but I let her lead the way. Behind us, more German I were shouting, but they seemed to be heading towards the skyline gates we'd left, just left. I allowed myself to hope that the train station might be clear. <laughs> it was not. On the tracks sat a miniature train, a bright green steam engine with a line of open passenger cars. Next to it on the station platform, under an ivy-covered canopy, the terraces stood with his foot feet planted, his unsheathed sword resting over his shoulder like a hobo's bindle. A battered leather cuirass was strapped over his corn husker's shirt. His dark curly hair hung in tendrils over his red bandana, making it look as if a large spider were crouched on his head, ready to spring. Welcome. The prefect's smile might have seemed friendly, except for the cross-hatching of scars on his face. He touched something in his ear, a Bluetooth device perhaps. They're here at the station, he announced. Converge on me, but slow and calm, I'm fine. I want these two alive. 
He shrugged at us apologetically. My men can be over-enthusiastic when it comes to killing, especially after you've made them look like fools. It was our pleasure. I doubt I pulled off the self-assured, swashbuckling tone I was going for. My voice cracked. Sweat beaded on my face. I held my bow sideways like an electric guitar, which was not proper shooting stance. In my other hand, instead of an arrow that might have been useful, I held a package of frozen tater tots. It was probably just as well. In my dream, I'd seen how rapidly Latirus's could swing his sword. If I tried to fire on him, our heads would be rolling on the ground before I drew back my bowstring. You're able to use a phone, I noticed, or a walkie-talkie, or whatever that is. I hate it when the bad guys get to talk to each other and we can't. Latirus's laugh was like a file across metal. Yes, the triumvirate likes to have certain advantages. I don't suppose you'll uh, tell us how they manage it, Blocking demigod communications? You won't live long enough for that to matter. Now, drop your bow. As for your friend, he sized up Calypso. Keep your hands at your side, no sudden curses. I'd hate to chop off that pretty head of yours. Calypso smiled sweetly. I was just thinking the same thing about you. Drop your sword and I won't destroy you. She was a good actor. I made a mental note to recommend her to my Mount Olympus invitation-only summer camp, method acting with the muses, if we get out of this alive. Latiris has chuckled. That's good, I like you. But in about 60 seconds, a dozen German and I are going to swarm this depot. They will not ask as politely as I did. He took a step forward and swung his sword to his side. I tried to think of a brilliant plan. Unfortunately, the only thing that came to mind was weeping in terror. Then, above Latiris's, the ivy rustled on the canopy. The swordsman didn't seem to notice. I wondered if orangutans were playing up there, or perhaps some Olympian gods had gathered for a picnic to watch me die. Or maybe... The fort was too much to wish for, but in the interest of buying time, I dropped my bow. Apollo, Calypso hissed. What are you doing? Latiris has answered for me. He's being smart. Now, where's the third member of your little party? I blinked. It's it's just the two of us. Latiris's facial scars rippled, white lines on tanned skin like the ridges of a sand dune. Come now, you flew into the city on a dragon, three passengers. I very much want to see Leo Valdez again. We have unfinished business. You know Leo. Despite the danger we were in, I felt a small sense of relief. Finally, some villain wanted to kill Leo more than he wanted to kill me. That was progress. Calypso didn't seem so happy. She stepped towards the swordsman with her fists clenched. What do you want with Leo? Latiris has narrowed his eyes. You're not the same girl who was with him before. Her name was Piper. You wouldn't happen to be Leo's girlfriend. Red blotches appeared in Calypso's cheeks and neck. Latiris is brightened. Oh, you are. That's wonderful. I can use you to hurt him. Calypso snarled. You will not hurt him. Above Latiris's, the canopy roof shook again, as if a thousand rats were scurrying through the rafters. The vines seemed to be growing, the foliage turning thicker and darker. Calypso, I said. Step back. Why should I? she demanded. This corn husker just threatened Calypso. I grabbed her wrist and yanked her from the shadow of the canopy, just as it collapsed on top of Latiris's. The swordsman disappeared under hundreds of pounds of shingles, lumber and ivy. I surveyed the mass of quivering vines. I saw no orangutans, no gods, no one who might have been responsible for the collapse. She must be here, I muttered. Who? Calypso stared at me with wide eyes. What just happened? I wanted to hope. I was afraid to hope. Whatever the case, we couldn't say. Latirisus was shouting and struggling under the wreckage, which meant he wasn't dead. His German eye would be here any second. Let's get out of here. I pointed to the green locomotive. I'm driving. Chapter 15. Driving the green train. I'm all like, choo-choo, choo-choo. Can't catch me. Oh, poop. A slow motion getaway was not what I had in mind. We both jumped onto the conductor's bench, which was barely wide enough for one, and jostled for space while punching pedals and turning random levers. I told you I'll drive, I yelled. If I can drive the sun, I can drive this. This isn't the sun. Calypso elbowed me in the ribs. It's a model train. I found the ignition switch. The train lurched into motion. Calypso will claim she find, found the igni ignition switch. This is a blatant lie. I pushed Calypso off the bench and onto the ground. Since the train was only going half a mile an hour, she simply stood up, brushed off her skirt, and walked alongside me, glaring. That's top speed, she demanded. Push some more levers. Behind us, from somewhere under the wreckage of the canopy, came a mighty blag... Ivy shivered in, Latiris's, in, in shivered as Latiris's tried to bust his way out. Half a dozen German I appeared at the far end of the platform. Commodus was definitely buying his barbarians by the imperial family size pack. 
The bodyguards stared at the screaming mass of roof wreckage. Then, a dust chewed chewing away. Rather than give chase, they began clearing the beams and vines to free their boss. Given the progress we were making, they probably assumed they'd have plenty of time to come after us. Calypso hopped onto the running board. She pointed to the controls. Try the blue pedal. The blue pedal is never the right one. She kicked it with her foot. We shot forward at three times our previous speed, which meant our enemies would not have to jog at a moderate pace to catch us. The track curved as we continued to accelerate, our wheels squealing against the outer rail. The station disappeared behind a line of trees. On our left, the terrain opened up, revealing the majestic butts of African elephants who were picking through a pile of hay. Their zookeeper frowned as we trundled past. Hey, he yelled. Hey! I waved. Morning! Then we were gone. The cars shook dangerously as we picked up steam. My teeth chattered and clattered. My bladder sloshed. Up ahead, almost hidden behind a screen of bamboo, a fork in the track was marked by a sign in Latin. Bonum Ephesio. There, I yelled. The good stuff. We need to turn left. Calypso squinted at the console. How? There should be a switch, I said. Something that operates the turnout. Then I saw it. Not on our console, but ahead of us. On the side of the tracks, an old-fashioned hand lever. There was no time to stop the train, no time to run ahead and turn the switch by hand. Calypso, hold this. I tossed her the tots and unslung my bow. I knocked an arrow. Once, such a shot would have been child's play for me. Now it was nearly impossible. Shooting from a moving train, aiming for a point where the focused impact of an arrow would have the maximum chance of triggering the switch. I thought of my daughter, Kayla, back at Camp Half-Blood. I imagined her calm voice as she coached me through the frustrations of mortal archery. I remembered the other campers' encouragement the day on the beach when I'd made a shot that brought down the Colossus of Nero. I fired. The arrow slammed into the lever and forced it backwards. The point blade shifted. We lurched onto the spur line. Down! Calypso yelled. We crashed through bamboo and careened into a tunnel just wide enough for the train. Unfortunately, we were going much too fast. The choo-choo tilted sideways, throwing sparks off the wall. By the time we shot out of the other side of the tunnel, we were completely off balance. The train groaned and tilted, a sensation I knew well from those times the sun chariot had to veer to avoid a launching space shuttle or a Chinese celestial dragon. Those things are annoying. Out! I tackled Calypso, yes, again, and leapt from the right side of the train as the line of cars spilled to the left, toppling off the tracks with a sound like a bronze-clad army being crushed by a giant fist. I may have crushed a few armies that way back in the old days. The next thing I knew I was on all fours, my ear pressed against the ground as if listening for a herd of buffalo, though I had no idea why. Apollo! Calypso tugged at the sleeve of my coat. Get up! My throbbing head felt several times larger than usual, but I didn't seem to have broken any bones. Calypso's hair had come loose around her shoulders. Her silver parka was dusted with sand and bits of gravel. Otherwise, she looked intact. Perhaps our formerly divine constitutions had saved us from damage. Either that or we were just lucky. We had crashed in the middle of a circular arena. The train lay curled sideways across the gravel, like a dead caterpillar, a few feet shy of where the tracks ended. The perimeter was ringed with animal enclosures, plexiglass walls framed in stone. Above that rose the three tiers of stadium seating. Over the top of the amphitheatre stretched a canopy of camouflage netting, like I'd seen at the orangutan habitat, though here I suspected the netting was meant to keep winged monsters from flying away. Around the arena floor, chains with empty manacles were fastened to spikes in the ground. Near those stood racks of sinister-looking tools, cattle prods, noose poles, whips, harpoons. A cold lump formed in my throat. I would have thought I'd swallowed a griffin tater, except that packet was still miraculously intact in Calypso's arms. This is a training facility, I said. I've seen places like it before. These animals are being readied for the games. Readied? Calypso scowled at the weapon racks. How exactly? They're enraged, I said, baited, starved, trained to kill anything that moves. Savagery. Calypso turned to the nearest pen. What have they done to those poor ostriches? Through the plexiglass, four of the birds stared at us, their heads jerking sideways in a series of fits. They were strange-looking animals to begin with, but these had been outfitted with rows of iron-studded collars around their necks, spiked war helmets in the Kaiser Wilhelm style, and razor wire wreathed like Christmas lights around their legs. The nearest bird snapped at me, revealing jagged steel teeth that had been fitted inside its beak. The Emperor's combat ostriches. I felt like a roof was collapsing inside my chest. The plight of these animals depressed me, but so did thinking about Commodus. The games he had engaged in as a young Emperor were disagreeable to start with, and they had transformed into something much worse. 
He used to enjoy using them for target practice. With a single arrow, he could decapitate a bird running at full gallop. Once that wasn't entertaining enough, I gestured at the enhanced war birds. Calypso's face turned jaundice yellow. All these birds will be killed. I was too dispirited to answer. I had flashbacks to the Flavian amphitheatre during Commodus's rule. The glistening red sand of the stadium floor, littered with the carcasses of thousands of exotic animals, all butchered for sport and spectacle. We moved to the next enclosure. A large red bull paced restlessly, his horns and hooves gleaming bronze. That's an Ethiopian bull, I said. Their hides are impervious to all metal weapons, like the Nemean lion, except uh, much larger and red. Calypso drifted past several more cells, some Arabian winged serpents, a horse that I judged to be the carnivorous, fire-breathing variety. I once thought about using those for as my sun chariot, but they were so high maintenance. The sorceress froze at the next window. Apollo, over here. Behind the glass were two griffins. Emmy and Josephine had been correct. They were magnificent specimens. Over the centuries, with their natural habitat shrinking, wild griffins had become scrawny creatures, smaller and scrappier than in ancient times much like the endangered free-eyed stoat or the giant gassy badger. Few griffins had ever been large enough to support the weight of a human rider. The male and female in front of us, however, truly were the size of lions. Their light brown fur gleamed like copper chainmail. Their russet wings folded regally across their backs. Their aquiline heads bristled with gold and white plumage. In the old days, a Grecian king would have paid a trireem full of rubies for a breeding pair like this. Thankfully, I saw no sign that the animals had been abused. However, both were chained by their back legs. Griffins get very cantankerous when they're imprisoned or restrained in any way. As soon as the male, Abelard, saw us, he snapped and squawked, flapping his wings. He dug his claws in the sand and strained against his shackle, trying to reach us. The female backed into the shadows, making a low gurgling noise like the growl of a threatened dog. She swayed from side to side, her belly low to the ground as if, Oh no, I feared my weak mortal heart would burst. No wonder Britomatus wanted these two back so badly. Calypso seemed entranced by the animals. With some difficulty, she focused on me. What do you mean? The female is with egg. She needs to, to nest immediately. If we don't get her back to the way station. Calypso's expression turned as sharp and steely as ostrich teeth. Will Helios be able to fly out of here? I, I think so. My sister is more the expert on wild animals, but yes. Can a pregnant griffin carry a rider? We don't have much choice except to try. I pointed at the netting above the arena. That's the quickest way out, assuming we can unlock the griffins and remove the net. The problem is, Heloise and Abelard are not going to see us as friends. They're chained. They're caged. They're expecting a baby. They'll tear us apart if we get close. Calypso crossed her arms. What about music? Most animals like music. I recalled the way I had used a song to mesmerise the mermeeks back at Camp Halfblood. But I really didn't feel like singing about all my failures again, especially not in front of my companion. I glanced back at the train tunnel. Still no sign of Latyrus's or his men, but that didn't make me feel better. They should have been here by now. We need to hurry, I said. The first problem was the easiest, the plexiglass wall. I reasoned there must be a switch somewhere for lowering the partitions to release the various animals. I climbed into the spectator tiers with the help of a stepladder named Calypso and found just such a control panel next to the arena's only padded seat, clearly for the Emperor himself when he wanted to check on the killer beasts in training. Each lever was conveniently labelled with masking tape and marker. One said Griffins. I called down to Calypso. Are you ready? She stood directly in front of the Griffin enclosure, hands out as if preparing to catch a projectile egg. What would constitute ready in a situation like this? I flipped the switch. With a heavy ka-chunk, the griffin's plexiglass screen dropped away, disappearing into a slot across the threshold. It rejoined Calypso, who was humming some sort of lullaby. The two griffins were not impressed. Heloise growled loudly, pressing herself against the back wall of the enclosure. Abelard pulled at his chain twice as hard, trying to reach us and bite off our faces. Calypso handed me the packet of tots. She pointed with her chin into the enclosure. You must be kidding, I said. If I get close enough to feed them, they'll eat me. She stopped her song. Aren't you the god of ranged weapons? Throw the tots. I raised my eyes towards the netted off heavens, which, by the way, I considered a rude and completely unnecessary metaphor for my exile from Olympus. Calypso, do you know nothing about these animals? To gain their trust, you must hand feed them, putting your fingers inside the beak. This emphasises that the food comes from you, as the mother bird. Huh. Calypso bit her lower lip. I see the problem. You would make a terrible mother bird. Abelard lunged and squawked at me. Everyone was a critic. 
Calypso nodded as if she'd come to a decision. It's going to take both of us. We'll sing a duet. You have a decent voice. I have a... My mouth was paralysed from shock. Telling me, the god of music, that had a decent voice was like telling Shaquille O'Neal he played decent offence or telling Annie Oakley she was a decent shot. Then again, I was not Apollo. I was Lester Papadopoulos. Back at camp, despairing of my puny mortal abilities, I had sworn an oath on the River Styx not to use archery or music until I was once again a god. I had probably broken that oath by singing to the Mermeeks, for a good cause, mind you. Ever since, I had lived in terror, wondering when and how the spirit of Styx would punish me. Perhaps instead of a grand moment of retribution, it would be a slow death by a thousand insults. How often could a music god hear that he had a decent voice before he crumbled into a self-loathing pile of dust? Fine, I laughed and sighed. Which duet should we sing? Islands in the stream? Don't know it. I got you, babe? No. Dear gods, I'm sure we covered the 1970s in your pop culture lessons. What about that song Zeus used to sing? I blinked. Zeus, singing. I found the concept mildly horrifying. My father thundered, he punished, he scolded, he glowered like a champion, but he did not sing. Calypso's eyes got a little dreamy. In the palace at Mount Orphus, when he was Cronus's cupbearer, Zeus used to entertain the court with songs. I shifted uncomfortably. I, I hadn't been born yet. I knew, of course, that Calypso was older than I, but I'd never really thought about what that meant. Back when the Titans ruled the cosmos, before the gods rebelled and Zeus became king, Calypso, have no doubt, been a carefree child, one of General Atlas's brood, running around the palace harassing the aerial servants. Ye gods, Calypso was old enough to be my babysitter. Surely you know the song. Calypso began to sing. Electricity tingled at the base of my skull. I did know the song. An early memory surfaced of, surfaced of Zeus and Leto, singing this melody when Zeus visited Artemis and me as children on Delos. My father and mother, destined to be forever apart because Zeus was a married god. They had happily sung this duet. Tears welled in my eyes. I took the lower part of the harmony. It was a song older than empires, about two lovers separated and longing to be together. Calypso edged towards the griffins. I followed behind her, not because I was scared to lead, mind you. Everyone knows that when advancing into danger, the soprano goes first. They are your infantry, while the altos and tenors are your cavalry, and the bass your artillery. I've tried to explain this to Ares a million times, but he has no clue about vocal arrangement. Abelard ceased yanking at his chain. He prowled and preened, making deep clucking sounds like a roosting chicken. Calypso's voice was plaintive and full of melancholy. I realised that she emphasised with these be beasts. Uh, it caged and chained, yearning for the open sky. Perhaps, I thought, just perhaps Calypso's exile on Aegea had been worse than my present predicament. At least I had friends to share my suffering. I felt guilty that I hadn't voted to release her earlier from her island. But why should she, she why should she forgive me if I apologise now? That was all sticks water under the gates of Erebos. There was no going back. Calypso put her hand on Abelard's head. He could easily have snapped off her arm, but he crouched and turned into the caress like a cat. Calypso knelt, removed another hairpin and began working on the griffin's manacle. While she tinkered, I tried to keep Abelard's eyes on me. I sang as decently as I could, channeling my sorrow and sympathy into the verses, hoping Abelard would understand that I was a fellow soul in pain. Calypso popped the lock. With a clank, the iron cuff fell off from Abelard's back leg. Calypso moved towards Heloise, a much trickier proposition. Approaching an expecting mother, Heloise growled suspiciously, but not in attack. We continued to sing, our voices in perfect pitch now, melding together the way the best harmonies do creating something greater than the sum of two individual voices. Calypso freed Heloise. She'd stepped back and stood shoulder to shoulder with me as we finished the last line of the song. As long as God shall live, so long shall I love you. The griffins stared at us. They seemed more intrigued now than angry. Tots, Calypso advised. I shook half the packet into her palms. I didn't relish the idea of losing my arms. They were useful appendages. Nevertheless, I proffered a handful of golden tater tots to Abelard. He scuttled forward and sniffed. When he opened his beak, I reached inside and pressed the tots on his warm tongue. Like a true gentleman, he waited until I removed my hand before swallowing down the snack. He ruffled his neck feathers and then turned to squawk at Heloise. Yeah, good eating, come on over. Calypso fed her tots to Heloise. The female griffin butted her head against the sorceress in a sign of obvious affection. For a moment, I felt relief, elation. We had succeeded. Then behind us, someone clapped. 
standing at the threshold, bloody and battered, but still very much alive, was, was Latyrus's, all by himself. Well done, said the swordsman. You found a perfect place to die. Chapter 16. Son of Amidas, you, sir, are a stupid head. Here, have an ostrich. In my 4,000 years of life, I had searched for many things. Beautiful women, handsome men, the best composite bows, the perfect seaside palace and a 1958 Gibson Flying V. But I had never searched for a perfect place to die. Calypso, I said weakly. Yeah, if we die here, I'd just like to say you aren't as bad as I originally thought. Thanks, but we're not going to die. That would deprive me of killing you later. Latyrus has chuckled. Oh, you two, bantering like you have a future. It must be hard for former, former immortals to accept that death is real. Me, I've died. Let me tell you, it's no fun. I was tempted to sing to him the way I had with the Griffins. Perhaps I could convince him I was a fellow sufferer. Something told me it wouldn't work, and alas, I was all out of tater tots. You're the son of, son of King Midas, I said. You came back to the mortal world when the doors of death were open. I didn't know much about that incident, but there'd been some massive underworld jailbreak during the recent war with the Giants. Hades had ranted non-stop about Gaia stealing all his dead people so they could work for her. Honestly, I couldn't blame the Earth Mother. Good, cheap labour is terribly difficult to find. The swordsman curled his lip. We came through the doors of death, all right. Then my idiot father promptly got himself killed again, thanks to a run-in with Leo Valdez and his crew. I survived only because I was turned into a gold statue and covered with a rug. Calypso backed towards the griffins. That's quite a story. Doesn't matter, snarled the swordsman. The triumvirate offered me work. They recognised the worth of Latyrus's reaper of men. Impressive title, I managed. He raised his sword. I earned it, believe me. My friends call me Lit, but my enemies call me Deaf. I'll call you Lit, I decided, though you don't strike me as very Lit. You know, your father and I used to be great friends. Once I even gave him ass's ears. As soon as I said that, I realised it was perhaps not the best proof of my friendship. Lit gave me a cruel smile. Yes, I grew up hearing about that music contest you made my dad judge. Gave him donkey ears because he declared you your opponent the winner. Hey, my father hated you so much for that. I was almost tempted to like you, but I don't. He sliced through the air in practice swipe. It'll be a pleasure to kill you. Hold on, I shrieked. What about all that take them alive business? Lit shrugged. I changed my mind. First, that roof collapsed on me. Then my bodyguards got swallowed by a stand of bamboo. I don't suppose you know anything about that? My pulse boomed like timpani in my ears. No. Right. He regarded Calypso. I think I'll keep you alive long enough to kill you in front of Valdez's face. That'll be fun. But this former god here... Lit shrugged. I'll just have to tell the emperor he resisted arrest. This was it. After four millennia of glory, I was going to die in a griffin enclosure in Indianapolis. I confess, hadn't envis envisioned my death this way. I hadn't envisioned it, envisioned it at all. But if I had to go, I wanted a lot more explosions and blazing spotlights. A host of beautiful weeping gods and goddesses crying, No! Take us instead! And a lot less animal poop. Surely Zeus would intercede. He couldn't allow my punishment on Earth to include actual death. Or perhaps Artemis would slay Lit with an arrow of death. She could always tell Zeus it was a freak longbow malfunction. At the very least, I hoped the griffins would come to my aid, since I'd fed them and sung to them so sweetly. None of that happened. Abelard hissed at Latyrus, but the griffins seemed reluctant to attack. Perhaps Latyrus had used those sinister training implements on him and his mate. The swordsman rushed with blinding speed. He swung his blade horizontally, right towards my neck. My last thought was how much the cosmos would miss me. The last thing I smelled was the scent of baked apples. Then, from somewhere above, a small humanoid form dropped between me and my attacker. With a clang and a burst of sparks, Latyrus's blade stopped cold in the crook of a golden X, the crossed blades of Meg McCaffrey. I may have whimpered. I had never been so happy to see anyone in my life, and that includes Hyacinthus in the time he wore that amazing tuxedo on our date night. So you know I mean it. Meg pushed with her blades and sent Latyrus's stumbling backwards. Her dark pageboy hair was festooned with twigs and blades of grass. She wore her usual red high tops, her yellow leggings and the green dress Sally Jackson had lent her the first day we met. I found this strangely heartwarming. Latyrus sneered at her, but he did not look particularly surprised. I wonder if threatening this idiot god would smoke you out of hiding. You've signed your death warrant. Meg uncrossed her blades. She retorted in her typical poetic fashion. Nope. Calypso glanced at me. She mouthed the question. This is Meg? 
This is Meg, I agreed, which encompassed a lot of explanation in a very short exchange. The terraces stepped sideways to block the exit. He was limping slightly, probably from his incident with a canopy. You dropped that ivy-covered roof on me, he said. You made the bamboo attack my men. Yup, Meg said. You're stupid. Lit hissed in annoyance. I understood this effect Meg had on people. Still, my heart was humming a perfect middle sea of happiness. My young protector had returned. Yes, yes, she was technically my master, but let's not mince words. She had seen the error of her ways. She had rebelled against Nero. Now she would stay by my side and help me retain my godhood. Cosmic order had been restored. Then she glanced back at me. Instead of beaming with joy or hugging me or apologising, she said, Get out of here. The command jarred me to the bones. I stepped back as if pushed. I was filled with a sudden desire to flee. When we'd parted, Meg had told me I was released from her service. Now it was clear that our master-servant relationship could not be so easily broken. Zeus meant me to follow her commands until I died or became a god again. I wasn't sure he cared which. But Meg, I pleaded, you just arrived. We must go, she said. Take the griffins and get out. I'll hold off stupid head. Lit laughed. I've heard you're a decent sword fighter, McCaffrey, but no child can ma match the reaper of men. He spun his blade like Pete Townsend windmilling his guitar, a move I taught Pete, though I never approved of the way he smashed his guitar into the speakers afterwards. Such a waste. Demeter is my mother too, Lit said. Her children make the best swordsmen. We understand the need to reap. It's just the flip side of sowing, isn't it, little sister? Let's see what you know about reaping lives. He lunged. Meg counted his strike and drove him back. They circled each other, three swords, whirling in a deadly dance like blender blades, making an air smoothie. Meanwhile, I was compelled to walk towards the griffins, as Meg had ordered. I tried to do it slowly. I was reluctant to take my eyes off the battle, as if merely by watching Meg I was somehow lending her strength. Once, when I was a god, that would have been possible. But now, what good could a spectating Lester do? Calypso stood in front of Heloise, protecting the mother-to-be with her body. I made it to Calypso's side. You're lighter than I, I said. You ride Heloise. Be careful of her gut. I'll take Abelard. What about Meg? Calypso demanded. We can't leave her. Just yesterday, I toyed with the idea of leaving Calypso behind to the Bleme where she was when she was wounded. I'd like to say that wasn't a serious thought, but it had been, however briefly. Now Calypso refused to leave Meg, whom she barely knew. It was almost enough to make me question whether I was a good person. I stressed the word almost. You're right, of course. I glanced across the arena. In the opposite enclosure, the combat ostriches were peering through their plexiglass, following the sword fight with prof professional interest. We need to move this party. I turned to address Abelard. I apologise in advance. I'm terrible at riding griffins. The griffin squawked as if to say, Do what you gotta do, man. He allowed me to climb aboard and tuck my legs behind the base of his wings. Calypso followed my example, carefully straddling Heloise's spine. The griffins, impatient to be gone, bounded past the sword fight and into the arena. Latiris's lunged as I passed him. He would have taken off my right arm, but Meg blocked his strike with one sword and swept at Lit's feet with the other, forcing him back again. Take those griffins and you'll only suffer more, Lit warned. All the Emperor's prisoners will die slowly, especially the little girl. My hand shook with anger, but I managed to knock an arrow in my bow. Meg, I yelled. Come on. I told you to leave, she complained. You're a bad slave. On that, at least we agreed. Latirisus advanced on Meg again, slashing and stabbing. I was no expert on swordplay, but as good as Meg was, I feared she was outmatched. Latirisus had more strength, speed and reach. He was twice Meg's size. He'd been practising for countless more years. If Latirisus hadn't recently been injured from having a roof dropped on him, I suspected the fight might have been over already. Go on, Apollo, Lit taunted. Fire that arrow at me. I'd seen how fast he could move. No doubt he would pull an Athena and slash my arrow out of the sky before it hit him. So unfair, but shooting at him had never been my plan. I leaned towards Abelard's head and said, Fly! The griffin launched himself into the air as if my added weight was nothing. He circled around the stadium tiers, screeching for his mate to join him. Heloise had more trouble. She lumbered halfway across the arena floor, flapping her wings and growling with discomfort before getting airborne, with Calypso clinging to her neck for dear's life. Heloise began flying in a tight circle behind Abelard. There was nowhere for us to go, not with the net above us, but I had more immediate problems. Meg stumbled, barely managing to parry Lit's strike. His neck cut, next cut sliced across Meg's thigh, ripping her leggings. The yellow fabric quickly turned orange from the flow of blood. Lit grinned. You're good, little sister, but you're getting tired. You don't have the stamina to face me. Abelard, I murmured. 
We need to get the girl. Dive. The griffin complied with a bit too much enthusiasm. I almost missed my shot. I let my arrow fly, not as Latiris's, not at Latiris's, but at the control box next to the Emperor's seat, aiming for a lever I had noted earlier, the one that read Omnia. Everything. Wang. The arrow hit its mark. With a series of satisfying kachunks, the plexiglass shields dropped from all the enclosures. Latiris's was too busy to realise what had happened. Being dive-bombed by a griffin tends to focus one's attention. Lit backed away, allowing Abelard to snatch Meg McCaffrey in his paws and soar upward again. Lit gate, at us in dismay. Good trick, Apollo. But where will you go? You're... That's when he was run over by a herd of armoured ostriches. The swordsman disappeared under a tidal wave of feathers, razor wire and warty pink legs. As Latiris squawked like a goose, curling up to protect himself, the winged serpents, fire-breathing horses and Ophiopian bull came out to join the fun. Meg! I stretched out my arm. While precariously gripped in Abelard's paws, she willed her swords to shrink back into golden rings. She caught my hand. Somehow I managed to pull her onto Abelard and seat her in front of me. The flying serpents fluttered towards Heloise, who squawked defiantly and beat her mighty wings, climbing towards the netting. Abelard followed. My heart hammered against my ribs. Surely we couldn't bust through the net. It would be designed to withstand brute force, beaks and claws. I imagined us hitting the barrier and getting bounced back to the arena floor, as if on a reverse trampoline. It seemed an undignified way to die. A moment before, we would have slammed into the net. Calypso thrust up her arms. She howled in rage, and the net blasted upwards, ripped from its moorings, and was tossed into the sky like a giant tissue in a gale-force wind. Free and unhurt, we soared out of the arena. I stared at Calypso in amazement. She seemed as surprised as I was. Then she slumped and listed sideways. Heloise compensated, shifting her pitch to keep the sorceress on board. Calypso, looking only semi-conscious, clung weakly to the griffin's fur. As our two noble steeds rose into the sky, I glanced down at the arena. The monsters were engaged in a vicious free-for-all, but I saw no sign of Latirisus. Meg twisted to face me, her mouth set in a ferocious scowl. You were supposed to go! Then she wrapped her arms around me and hugged me, so tightly I felt new fracture lines developing on my ribs. Meg sobbed her face buried in my shirt, her whole body shaking. As for me, I did not weep. No, I'm sure my eyes were quite dry. I did not bawl like a baby in the slightest. The most I will admit is this. With her tears moistening my shirt, her cat-eye glasses digging uncomfortably into my chest, her smell of baked apples, dirt, and sweat overwhelming my nostrils, I was quite content to be annoyed, once again, by Meg McCaffrey. Chapter 17. To the way station, Meg McCaffrey eats my bread, I cry godly tears. Heloise and Abelard knew where to go. They circled the waystation roof until a section of shing shingles slid open, allowing the griffins to spiral into the great hall. They landed on the ledge, side by side in their nest, as Josephine and Leo scrambled up the ladders to join us. Josephine threw her arms first around Heloise's neck, then Abelard's. Oh, my sweethearts, you're alive! The griffins cooed and leaned against her in greeting. Josephine beamed at Meg McCaffrey. Welcome, I'm Joe. Meg blinked, apparently not used to such an enthusiastic greeting. Calypso half climbed, half tumbled from Heloise's back. She would have toppled off the ledge if Leo hadn't caught her. Whoa, Mamacita, he said. You okay? She blinked sleepily. I'm fine. Don't fuss and don't call me. She crumpled against Leo, who struggled to keep her upright. He glared at me. What did you do to her? Not a thing, I protested. I believe Calypso managed to, well, make some magic. I explained what had happened in the zoo. Our encounter with Latirisus, our escape, and how the arena's netting had suddenly shot into the sky like a squid from a water cannon, one of Poseidon's less successful prototype weapons. Meg added unhelpfully, It was crazy. Latirisus, Leo muttered, I hate that guy. Is Cal going to be okay? Josephine checked Calypso's pulse, then pressed a hand against her forehead. Slumped against Leo's shoulder, the sorcerer snored like a razor-back sow. She's blown a circuit, Josephine announced. Blown a circuit, Leo yelped. I don't like blown circuits. Just an expression, bud, said Josephine. She's overextended herself magically. We should get her to Emmy in the infirmary. Here. Josephine scooped up Calypso. Ignoring the ladder, she jumped off the ledge and landed easily on the floor 20 feet below. Leo scowled. I could have done that. He turned to Meg. No doubt he recognised her from her many tales of woe. After all, young girls in traffic-like coloured clothing and rhinestone cat-eye glasses were not common. You're... Meg McCaffrey, he decided. Yep. Cool, I'm Leo, and, uh, he pointed at me. 
I understand you can, like, control this guy? I cleared my throat. We merely cooperate. I'm not controlled by anyone. Right, Meg? Slap yourself, Meg commanded. I slapped myself. Leo grinned. Oh, this is too good. I'm going to check on Calypso, but later we need to talk. He slid down the ladder railings, leaving me with a deep sense of foreboding. The griffins settled into their nests, clucking contentedly to each other. I was no griffin midwife, but Heloise, thank the gods, seemed no worse for wear after her flight. I faced Meg. My cheeks stung where I'd slapped myself. My pride had been trampled like the Tyrus's under a herd of combat ostriches. Nevertheless, I felt remarkably happy to see my young friend. You rescued me. Then I added two words that never came easily to a god. Thank you. Meg gripped her elbows. On her middle fingers, her gold rings glinted with the crescent symbol of her mother, Demeter. I had bandaged her cut thigh as best I could while we were in flight, but she still looked shaky on her feet. I thought she might cry again, but when she met my eyes, she wore her usual willful expression, as if she were about to call me poop face or order me to play princess versus dragon with her. I never got to be the princess. I didn't do it for you, she said. I tried to process that meaningless phrase. Then why? That guy. She waved her fingers over her face, indicating Latiris's scars. He was bad. Well, I can't argue with that. And the ones who drove me from New York. She made her icky expression. Marcus, Vortigan. They said things. What they would do in Indianapolis. She shook her head. Bad things. I wondered if Meg knew that Marcus and Vortigan had been beheaded for letting her escape. I decided not to mention it. If Meg was really curious, she could check their Facebook status updates. Next to us, the griffins snuggled in for a well-deserved rest. They tucked their heads under their wings and purred, which would have been cute if they didn't sound like chainsaws. Meg, I faltered. I felt as if a plexiglass wall divided us, though I wasn't sure whom it was protecting from whom. I wanted to say so many things to her, but I wasn't sure how. I summoned my courage. I'm going to try. Meg studied me warily. Try what? To tell you how I feel. To clear the air. Stop me if I say something wrong, but I think it's obvious we still need each other. She didn't respond. I don't blame you for anything, I continued. The fact that you left me alone in the grove of Dodona, that you lied about your stepfather. Stop! I waited for her faithful servant Peaches the Carpos to fall from the heavens and tear my scalp off. It didn't happen. What I mean, I tried again, is that I am sorry for everything you have been through. None of it was your fault. You should not blame yourself. That friend, Nero, played with your... Yeah, that fiend, Nero, played with your emotions, twisted your thoughts. Stop! Perhaps I could put my feelings into a song. Stop! Or I could tell you a story about a similar thing that once happened to me. Stop! A short riff on my ukulele. Stop! This time, though, I detected the faintest hint of a smile tugging at the corner of Meg's mouth. Can we at least agree to work together? I asked. The Emperor in this city is searching for us both. If we don't stop him... He will do many more bad things. Meg raised her left shoulder to her ear. Okay. A gentle crackling sound came from the griffin's nest. Green shoots were sprouting from the dry hay, perhaps a sign of Meg's improving mood. I remembered Cleander's words in my nightmare. You should have realised how powerful she is becoming. Meg had somehow tracked me to the zoo. She'd caused ivy to grow until it collapsed a roof. She'd made bamboo plants swallow a squad of germanite. She'd even teleported away from her escorts in Dayton using a clump of dandelions. Few children of Demeter had ever had such abilities. Still, I was under no illusions that Meg and I could skip away from here arm in arm, our problems forgotten. Sooner or later, she would have to confront Nero again. Her loyalties would be tested, her fears played upon. I could not free her of her past, even with the best song or ukulele riff. Meg rubbed her nose. Is there any food? Hadn't realised how tense I'd been until I relaxed. If Meg was thinking of food, we were back on the path to normalcy. There is food. I lowered my voice. Mind you, it's not as good as Sally Jackson's seven-layer dip, but Emmy's fresh-baked bread and homemade cheese are quite acceptable. Behind me, a voice said dryly, So glad you approve. I turned. At the top of the ladder, Emmy was glaring, griffin claws at me. Lady Britomatis is downstairs. She wants to talk to you. The goddess did not say thank you. She did not shower me with praise, offer me a kiss, or even give me a free magic net. Brita Martis simply waved her seats across the dinner table and said, sit. She was dressed in a gauzy black dress over a fishnet bodysuit, a look that reminded me of Stevie Nicks, circa 1981. We did a fabulous duet on Stop Dragging My Heart Around. I got zero credit on the album, though. She propped her leather boots on the dining table as if she owned the place, which I guess she did, and twirled her auburn braid between her fingers. I checked my seat, then Meg's. 
for any spring-activated explosive devices, but without Leo's expert eye, I couldn't be sure. My only hope, Britta Martis looked distracted, perhaps too distracted for her usual fun and games. I sat, happily, my glutos did not explode. A simple meal had been laid out, more salad, bread and cheese. I hadn't realised it was lunchtime, but when I saw the food, food my stomach growled, I reached for the loaf of bread. Emmy pulled it away and gave it to Meg. Emmy smiled sweetly. Apollo, I wouldn't want you to eat anything that's only acceptable. There's plenty of salad, though. I stared miserably at the bowl of lettuce and cucumbers. Meg grabbed the entire bread loaf and ripped off a chunk, chewing it with gusto. Well, I say chewing. Meg stuffed so much into her mouth it was difficult to know if her teeth ever connected. Brito Martis laced her fingers in front of her. Even that simple gesture looked like an elaborate snare. Emmy, she said, how is the sorceress? Resting comfortably, my lady, said Emmy. Leo and Josephine are looking in on her. Ah, here they are now. Josephine and Leo strode towards the dining table. Leo's arms spread like the Rio de Janeiro Christ statue. You can all relax, he announced. Calypso is okay. The net goddess grunted as if disappointed. A thought struck me. I frowned at Britomatis. The net over the arena. Nets are your department. You helped blast it away, didn't you? Calypso couldn't have done that magic by herself. Britomatis smirked. I may have jump-started her power a bit. She'll be more useful to me if she can master her old abilities. Leo dropped his arms. But you could have killed her. The goddess shrugged. Probably not, but it's hard to say. Tricky stuff, magic. You never know when or how it's going to come out. She spoke with distaste, as if magic was some poorly controlled bodily function. Leo's ears began to smoke. He stepped towards the goddess. Josephine grabbed his arm. Let it go, bud. Between Emmy and me, we can take care of your girl. Leo wagged a finger at Britomatis. You're lucky these ladies are such bosses. Jo here, she told me that with enough time and training, she could probably help Calypso get her magic back all the way. Josephine shifted, her wrenches clinking in the pockets of her overalls. Leo, did you know she was a gangster? He grinned at me. Jo knew Al Capone. She had this secret identity and Leo, he flinched, which isn't my place to talk about. Oh, look, food. He took a seat and began cutting the cheese. Britomatis pressed her hands against the table. But enough about the sorceress, Apollo. I must admit, you did moderately well retrieving my griffins. Moderately well? I bit back a few nasty comments. I wondered if demigods ever felt the need to restrain themselves when facing ungrateful gods like this. No, surely not. I was special and different, and I deserve better treatment. So glad you approve, I muttered. Britomatis' smile was thin and cruel. I imagine nets wrapping around my feet, constricting the flow of blood in my ankles. As promised, I will now reward you. I'll give you information that will lead you directly to the palace of the Emperor, where you'll either make us proud or be executed in some horrible but creative fashion. Chapter 18. My dear Commodus, Commode is named after you. Hail, toilet Caesar. Why did people keep ruining my meals? First they served me food, then they explained how I was likely to die in the near future. I longed to be back on Mount Olympus where I could worry about more interesting things like hot trends in technopop, bumper car poetry slams and laying waste to naughty communities with my arrows of vengeance. One thing I'd learned from being mortal, contemplating death is much more fun when you're contemplating someone else's. Before Brita Martis could give us our reward, she insisted on a briefing from Josephine and Emmy, who had spent all day with Leo's help, preparing the way station for a siege. This guy's good, Josephine punched Leo's arm affectionately. The things he knows about Archimedes' spheres, really impressive. Spheres? Meg asked. Yeah, Leo said. They're these round things. Shut up. Meg went back to inhaling carbohydrates. We reset all the crossbow turrets, Joe continued. Primed the catapults, closed all exits and put way station on 24-hour surveillance mode. If anyone tries to get in, we'll know. They will try, Britomatis promised. It's only a matter of time. I raised my hand. And, uh, Festus? I hoped the wistfulness in my voice was not too obvious. I didn't want the others to think I was ready to fly off on our bronze dragon and leave the way station to sort out its own problems, though I was ready to do exactly that. Emmy shook her head. I scouted the State House grounds late last night and again this morning. Nothing. The Bleme must have taken your bronze suitcase to the palace. Leo clicked his tongue. I bet Latiris has it. When I get my hands on that crust-sucking corn husker. Which brings us to the point, I said. How does Leo, I mean, how do we find the palace? Britta Martis slid her feet off the table. She sat forward. The main gates to the Emperor's palace are under the Soldiers and Sailors Monument. Josephine grunted. Should have known. Why? I asked. 
What is that? Josephine rolled her eyes. A huge decorated column thing in the middle of a plaza, a few blocks north of here. Just the kind of ostentatious, over-the-top edifice you'd expect the emperor to have for his entrance. It's the biggest monument in the city, Emmy added. I tried to contain my bitterness. Soldiers and sailors were all very well, but if your city's biggest monument is not to Apollo, I'm sorry, you're doing something wrong. I suppose the palace is heavily guarded? Britomatis laughed. Even by my standards, the monument is a death trap. Machine gun turrets, lasers, monsters. Attempting the front door without an invitation would have dire consequences. Meg swallowed a chunk of bread, somehow managing not to choke. The emperor would let us in. Well, true, Britomatis agreed. He'd love for you and Apollo to knock on his front door and give yourselves up. But I only mentioned the main entrance because you should avoid it at all costs. If you want to get inside the palace without being apprehended and tortured to death, there's another possibility. Leo bit a cheese slice into the shape of a smile. He held it up to his mouth. Leo is happy when he's not being tortured to death. Meg snorted. A gob of bread shot out of her right nostril, but she didn't have the decency to look embarrassed. I could tell Leo and Meg were not going to be healthy influences on each other. Then, to get inside, said the goddess, you must use the waterworks. The plumbing system, I guessed. In my vision of the Emperor's throne room, I saw open trenches of flowing water. You know how to access them. Britomatis winked at me. You're not still afraid of water, I hope. I have never been afraid of water. My voice came out shriller than I intended. Hmm, Britomatis mused. Then why did the Greeks always pray to you for a safe landing whenever they were in dangerous waters? But, but because my mother was stuck in a boat when she was trying to give birth to me and Artemis, I can appreciate wanting to be on solid ground. And those rumours you can't swim? I remember at Triton's pool party. I can totally swim. Just because I didn't want to play Marco Polo with you in the deep end with contract contact mines. Hey, gaudy people, Meg interrupted. The waterworks? Right. For once I was relieved at Meg's lack of patience. Britomatis, how do we access the throne room? Britomatis narrowed her eyes at Meg. Gaudy people? She seemed to be pondering how McCaffrey would look wrapped in a lead-weighted hook net and dropped into the Mariana Trench. Well, Miss McCaffrey, to access the Emperor's water system, you'll need to search the city's canal walk. What's that? Meg asked. Emmy patted her hand. I can show you. It's an old canal that runs through downtown. They refurbished the area, built a bunch of new apartments and restaurants and whatnot. Leo popped his cheese smile into his mouth. I love whatnot. Britomatis smiled. That's fortunate, Leo Valdez, because your skills will be required to find the entrance, disarm the traps and whatnot. Hold up. Find the entrance. I thought you'd tell us where it was. I just did, said the goddess. Somewhere along the canal. Look for a grate. You'll know it when you see it. Uh-huh. And it'll be booby-trapped. Of course, but not nearly as much as the fortress's main entrance. And Apollo will have to overcome his fear of water. I don't have a fear. Shut up, Meg told me, causing my vocal cords to solidify like cold cement. She pointed a carrot at Leo. If we find the grate, can you get us in? Leo's expression made him look as serious and dangerous as it was possible for a small elfin demigod to look in a little girl's overalls. A clean pair, mind you, which he'd intentionally found and put on. I'm a son of Hephaestus, Chica. I can problem solve. This guy Latiris tried to kill me and my friends once before. Now he's threatened Calypso. Yeah, I'll get us inside that palace. Then I'm going to find Lit and light him up, I suggested. Surprised, but pleased to find I could speak again so soon after being told to shut up. So he's literally lit? Leo frowned. I wasn't going to say that. Seemed too corny. Well, when I said it, I assured him, it's poetry. Well, Britomatis rose, fish hooks and weights clinking in her dress. When Apollo starts talking poetry, that's my cue to leave. I wish I'd known that sooner, I said. She blew me an air kiss. Your friend Calypso should remain here. Josephine, if you can help her again control over her magic, she'll need it for the coming battle. Josephine drummed her fingers on the table. Been a long time since I've trained anyone in the ways of Hecate, but I'll do my best. Emmy, the goddess continued, you watch after my griffins. Heloise could lay her egg at any moment. Emmy's scalp turned crimson along her silver hairline. What about Georgina? You've given us away into the Emperor's palace. Now you expect us to stay here rather than go free our girl? Britomatis raised a hand in caution as if to say, you're very close to the Burmese tiger pit, my dear. Trust Meg, Leo and Apollo. This is their task, to find and free the captives, to retrieve the throne of Mycenae. And get Festus, Leo added. And especially Georgina, Joe added. We can pick up some groceries too, Leo offered. I noticed you're low on the hot sauce. Britomatis chose not to destroy him. 
though from her expression I could tell she came close. Tomorrow, at first light, search for the entrance. Why not earlier? Meg asked. The goddess smirked. <laughs> You're fearless, I respect that, but you must be rested and prepared to meet the Emperor's forces. You need that leg wound tended to. I also suspect it's been many nights since you've had a proper sleep. Besides, the incident at the zoo has the Emperor's security in high alert. Best to let the dust settle. If he catches you, Meg McCaffrey, I know. She did not sound afraid. Her tone was that of a child who'd been reminded for the fifth time to clean her room. The only sign of Meg's anxiety in her hand, her last piece of bread, had begun to sprout green tendrils of wheat. In the meantime, Britomartis said, I will try to locate the hunters of Artemis. They were in the area on a quest not long ago. Perhaps they are still close enough to come help defend this place. A hysterical giggle escaped my mouth. The idea of twenty or thirty other competent archers at my side, even if they were sworn maidens with no sense of humour, made me feel much safer. That would be good. But if not, said the goddess, you must be prepared to fight on your own. That would be typical, I sighed. And remember, the emperor's naming ceremony is the day after tomorrow. Thank you so much, I said. I needed the reminder. Oh, don't look so glum, Apollo. Britomartis gave me one last flirtatious, irritatingly cute smile. If you come out alive, we'll catch a movie together, I promise. Her gauzy black dress swirled around her in a tornado of netting, and then she was gone. Meg turned to me. Naming ceremony? Yes. I stared at her furry green piece of bread, wondering if it was still edible. The emperor is quite the megalomaniac. As he did in ancient times, he plans to rename his capital city after himself. Probably he'll rename the state, the inhabitants, and the months of the year, too. Meg snorted. Commode city. Leo gave her a tentative smile. What now? His name is... Don't, Meg, Josephine warned. Commodus. Meg continued and then frowned. Why am I not supposed to say his name? He pays attention to such things, I explained. There's no point in letting him know we are talking about... Meg took a deep breath and yelled, Commodus, 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 Commode City, Commo Commodiana, Commode Day, Month of Commodes, Commode Man. The great hall shook as if the way station itself had taken offence. Emmy blanched. Up in their roost, the griffins clucked nervously. Josephine grumbled. You shouldn't have done that here, hun. Leo just shrugged. Well, if Commode Man wasn't watching this channel before, I think he is now. That's dumb, Meg said. Don't treat him like he's so powerful. My stepfather, her voice caught. He, he said Commodus is the weakest of the three. We can take him. Her words struck me in the gut like one of Artemis's blunted arrows. And I can assure you those hurt. We can take him. The name of my old friend shouted over and over. I staggered to my feet, gagging, my tongue trying to dislodge itself from my throat. Whoa, Apollo. Leo rushed to my side. You okay? I, uh, another dry wretch. I staggered towards the nearest bathroom as a vision engulfed me, bringing me back to the day I committed murder.